Morning, guys. This is going to be uh, part one of the AP charge notes, and this would be what we would do uh, directly after the predictions that I did with the band graph generator and how charge interacts. So some of the stuff will be reviewed because we went over the demonstrations, but other things will be new. All right, so uh, thinking back to chemistry, what do we know about atoms? What makes them up, and what's their relative size? So it turns out that an average atom is about 10 to the negative 10 meters across. And they have two main parts. In the center is where all the mass is concentrated, and that's made up of the protons and the neutrons. The protons have what we call a positive charge. On the outside, it is mostly empty space, and somewhere in that empty space are electrons, and they have a negative charge. They do have a mass, but it's much smaller than uh, the mass of a proton or a neutron. So a proton or a neutron is more than 1,800 times more massive. And it turns out that these atoms are 99.999% empty space. And so this was illustrated around uh, the turn of the century, in the late 1800s, by Ernest Rutherford. If you remember in his experiment, he had a piece of gold foil, and he got it super, super thin. So it was just tens of an atom's thickness across, and he shot an alpha particle at it, which is just a uh, helium ion. And what happened was, to his surprise, that most of the alpha particles that he shot through went straight through because atoms were mostly empty space, which surprised him. But then some ricocheted off, and they didn't ricochet off the way billiard balls would ricochet off. They ricocheted off, instead of bouncing off straight, they kind of veered and went away. Like they were feeling some force, and that force was pushing them away. And so that made him uh, deduce that there was a positively charged massive object in the middle of the atom. The elementary charge, and I'm going to go over in class why one's positive, one's negative, but it's an explanation from Ben Franklin that really goes back to accounting. A proton and an electron have the same charge magnitude. One is taken to be positive, one is taken to be negative. Neutrons have no charge, but their mass is almost the same as a proton. And we said that an electron's mass is over 1,800 times smaller. Most things have the same amount of protons and electrons, and so we don't really worry about the charge. And we would call those things overall neutral. But through friction, you can do work, and you can take some electrons off of one and put them on the other. And so now this has an overall negative charge. This has an overall positive charge. Together, the charge still adds up. It is conserved. In our picture, they're charging up a ruler, and they're attracting uh, bits of paper. So even though the bits of paper are neutral, they'll behave like they're charged, which is another thing that we saw in the demonstrations. If you have an excess of charge, we measured this in uh, coulombs, which is our next new elementary unit. So up to this point, we only had three. Everything was made up of combination of meters, kilograms, and seconds. And now we have a new one, which is going to be a measure of, of charge, which is a coulomb. They made up this unit much earlier, 100 years before Rutherford did his experiments. This is in the late 1700s, they're doing this in Paris. It turns out that a coulomb is a lot, a lot, a lot of charge. It ends up at 6.25 times 10 to the 18th electrons. That's a lot of charge. This is named for Charles de Coulomb. We're going to see his equation in a little bit, but he's the one that devised the equation to account for, uh, to measure the force of attraction between charged things. And we'll do a lab in class where uh, you'll measure this as well. It turns out that 
like charges will repel like charges and unlike charges will attract. So if you remember uh, that popular Paul Abdul song, Opposites Attract, it's the same premise. So things are opposite, they'll have a force of attraction. If they're the same, they'll have the force of repulsion. So in our picture here, we have uh, two plastic rulers that had an excess negative. They're going to repel each other. We have two glass rods that are excess positive. Uh, if you rub a glass rod on silk, it will make it positive with a silk negative. These will repel. And if you had a charged ruler or a glass rod charged, they would attract. And it turns out that this would also happen if one of them was neutral as well which we'll get into in a little bit. Some of this stuff, just like magnetism, goes all the way down to the atomic level. Uh, a good example of this is water. So water is a polar molecule. It has a side that's negative and a side that's positive. So our oxygen side ends up being negative. Our hydrogen side ends up being positive. Water will behave like it has an overall charge. It will be polarized. I showed you guys a number of demonstrations with conductors and insulators. Uh, conductors are things that will allow charge to flow freely. Insulators, they won't. So down here I have two metal spheres. Uh, one of them is missing six negative charges, which gives it a net charge of positive six charges. The other one has the same amount of positive and negatives, so it's neutral. If I connect them with a conductor, the charge is free to flow. So what's going to happen, that charge doesn't like the same charge. It's going to try to get as far away from the same charge as possible. If I touch it to an insulator, nothing's going to happen. Charge is not going to freely flow through the wood from one metal sphere into the other uh, some things are semiconductors, which if you study electronics, that will be a case. Uh, you can get things and dope them in small amounts of elements, and then if you uh, apply a small voltage, they'll go from not being a conductor to being a conductor, which is the idea of a transistor, which we'll get into when we get into circuits. Not in the AP test, but maybe the greatest, the most important invention of the 20th century. So uh, we can transfer this electric charge in a number of ways. And we can do it in different ways for conductors and for insulators. Conductors are things that are typically metals. Uh, in the outside of metals, they learned that the metal with the atoms next to it will freely exchange electrons back and forth. And so it makes sense that we can get them to flow if we give it uh, some kind of potential in one direction. This doesn't happen as often in insulators. But if you think about what happened with Deborah, we did get the charge to go out of her hair. So I had such a huge potential that I was creating with that Van de Graaff generator, you know, hundreds of thousands of volts that you could actually make that charge try to get far enough away from each other. So this is typically glass, plastic, rubber. If you put charge on it, it'll stay where it is. Uh, things that are good conductors of electricity typically have loose electrons. So they're free to share their outside electrons. And typically, things that are good, ele good electrical conductors are also good conductors of heat. So if you think about, like, you know, a pan. If you've ever uh, sat on metal benches, at like a stadium compared to like wood ones. Uh, the metal ones are always colder because they're conducting your heat away. Uh, the wood ones will retain some of that heat. Or if you touch a, a metal doorknob, it always feels cold. All right, so uh, we can have polarization of charge. This will happen in both insulators and conductors. Uh, we saw this with the pit balls. We saw it with the electroscope. We saw it with uh, the balloon and the wall. 
So the idea is that if you charge something up so it has an excess of charge and you bring it near something that is neutral that has the same amount as positive and negative, uh, it's going to cause the negatives to either move towards the object or move away from the object. And so when I bring my negatively charged object close, the negatives will move away from it and it's going to behave like it's charged, even though it's all overall neutral. You can also transfer things by contact. Uh, if you transfer something by contact in an insulator, an insulator is better at keeping that charge and not losing it. A conductor, since it tries to get far away, will lose it very often to the environment. That's the reason why our electroscope had uh, glass on the front and glass on the back. So it kind of isolates the charge that's on the leaves in the middle from the air outside because you lose it to the air. But uh, in the day before we had a lot of latex allergies, I would charge up a balloon and I would stick it to the television screen in here, and it would typically stay up until the next day. So I put it on insulator, and it stayed on that insulator, and it would stay up for a long thing, long time. Uh, when I charged with the pith balls, they stayed charged. Uh, Deborah, once her hair was up there, it would stay charged. That's not going to be the case with conductors. All right, so... Uh, with conductors, you can charge by induction. So these are two metal spheres that are used for uh, this demonstration. And the idea is that If I touch them together and they're both conductors, they're going to behave as a single conductor, right? Because they're both metal. So if I charge this up, doing work by friction, putting charge on this, if I bring it close to one side, not touching it, the negative on my rod is going to repel negative off of this one and put it on the one that's further away. Now, if I grab the one that's further away by its insulating stand and move it away, and now separate these two, I have one that was closer to the rod that's gonna have an overall positive charge, and one that was further away from the rod that's gonna have an overall negative charge. So it's charged by induction. If I put them back together, the charge would spread back out and they both would be neutral. So that's charging by induction. Now, if I would have brought the charge rod close and then took it away and then separated them, you wouldn't have that. So you actually have to separate them while you're bringing it close to it. But it's charging over, over space. All right, so on our electroscope, we can see a, a couple of these different situations. I have a glass rod that was rubbed against silk, so there's an overall positive charge. I have my electroscope where my leaves are not being displaced, which shows me that I don't have a net charge. I bring my positively charged glass rods to the top of the electroscope. Remember, this is all, even though it is three parts, they're all metal and they're connected, right? We have the ball on the top, we have a metal rod going down, and then in the bottom I have the two leaves that are also metal, and they can easily pivot, and they're very light. So when I bring it close, it's going to cause polarization. So this is overall neutral. It has the same amount of positive and negatives. When I bring this positive close, it's going to cause negatives to migrate up here. That's going to leave positives down there on the leaves, and they're going to separate. So the electroscope is going to look like it has an overall net charge. But if I take the rod away, 
If I go backwards, it's going to go back to showing that it has no net charge at all. Now, if I touch it to the top of the electroscope, these three negatives are going to come up here to and cancel out these three positives. And so now those three positives that were down here are by themselves. So now when I take this rod away, and, and keep in mind, right, with an insulator, if I want to get that charge off, it's like buttering a piece of bread. It's not going to, you're not going to get all the butter off unless you spread it all the way across. So only where you're touching it is it going to do the charge. So now once I move this away, this one, this one, and this one really dislike each other. So what are they going to try to do? They're going to try to get as far apart as possible. And so my electroscope is going to show that it has an overall charge. Going back to the beginning, we had five positive charges as a net. In this slide, we also have five positive charges as a net because three positives and three negatives would cancel out. Here, I have five positive charges, two on the rod and three on the bottom of the electroscope. And here, I have five positive charges, two on the rod and three on the electroscope that are far apart from each other on the conductor. All right, so as always, the way we learn things is to connect them to things we already know. And so I'm going to try to connect the force of attraction or repulsion between things that have an overall net charge with the force of attraction between two masses in our universe. And if you remember when I first talked about this, when I first introduced this to you, uh, we looked at a special situation. And that was the force of attraction between some object that's on the surface of the earth. And we called that weight. And that was equal to mass times the acceleration due to gravity. Now, really, this is a special case of the bigger equation, which is Newton's universal law of gravitation. where g is a constant at 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newton meter squared over kilogram squared m1 and m2 are masses they don't have to be like a big mass and a little mass, or doesn't have to have an earth that could be between you and the chair. And then R is going to be a distance between the center of masses, and that's measured in meters. Now, if we're talking about a planet, that ends up being its radius. So it makes sense why it ends up being an R. Because if I'm going to consider myself on the surface of the Earth, I would consider the mass of the Earth, that 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms, as being concentrated all the way in the center, which would be the radius, if I figured out what the center of mass was. The most important of this is R squared, because this part is squared. So if I doubled my mass, I would double my force. If I have my radius, my force would go up by a factor of four. So as far as AP is concerned, we're concerned about how things are related. So F of G is directly proportional to mass. And F of G is inversely proportional to R squared. Or it's directly proportional to 1 over R squared. G is a universal constant that they found, which made the math work. So uh, experimentally, both of these equations are figured out in the same way. And they're, they both deal with torsion balances. So 
uh, torsion is a twisting force, more of like a spring. How much we stretch it is related to its displacement. If you can imagine just like a string going down, and then we're going to measure when we apply a force, how much it twists on the axis, what a tiny little force that would be. And that's how they measured uh, this Coulomb force and the universal gravitation force. So this is just this universal constant. So this equation looks similar. So Coulomb's law is going to be Fe equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, Q1, Q2 over R squared. On your equation sheet, they rewrite 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 as K. Uh, K is 9 times 10 to the 9th Newton meter squared over Coulomb squared. Really, it's 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. Epsilon 0 is a constant that accounts for how charge affects other charge in free space. Uh, it's the permittivity constant. We have a permeability constant that does the same thing for momentum, which is mu naught. And it turns out that you don't need to know this, but... One divided by the square root of our permeability constant times our permeativity constant ends up being the speed of light, which is something that uh, James Clerk Maxwell discovered. Which we won't get in Maxwell's equations, but they're a big part of electricity and magnetism. So we can write this as F equals K Q1 Q2 over R squared. This is going to give us magnitudes. We're going to get our direction from signs. Uh, very often, this is written with absolute value bars around the force and the charge. So I'd ask you not to put in the negative or positive charges and consider that at the end, like whether it's uh, attractive or repulsive. All right, so let's look at uh, a typical force between two things that would have charge. And so we'll think about two electrons and separated by about the average diameter of an atom, which would be a reasonable separation between two electrons. So my equation, and I would appreciate it if you guys did a little subscript E. I know in your book they just have F by itself. Uh, F should never be by itself. Just capital F by itself is a no-no. And this is going to be K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. I'm going to plug in my 9 times 10 to the 9th meter squared over Coulomb squared. I'm going to leave out the sign of the charge. And again, this is good for you to practice putting into your calculators. Uh, you probably haven't done anything with this much exponents since chemistry. This is the only equation in the charge uh, section. I'm going to go a little bit into uh, electric fields and electric potential energy, but that isn't... Uh, that isn't on the AP test, but I do think that it helps you understand how circuits work. So I have 2.3 times 10 to the negative 8 newtons. So it's still a force. And since they're electrons, they have the same sign, I'm going to say that this is repulsive. Now you could draw this uh, if you had a free body diagram, right? you'd be able to show what direction it is with that arrow. What is the weight associated with an electron on Earth? 
And again, this is on your equation sheet. Don't waste your time memorizing these constants. Memorization is a total waste of time. There's no reason why you would ever need to just off the top of your head know what this is. All right, so we have 9.11 times 10 to the 30th newtons. So if I compare this to these two forces, the electrostatic force, and again, there would be a force of attraction between the masses of the electrons. I didn't do that. There would be much less than the, the force of gravity on it, right? This force is more than this times more than the gravitational force of the Earth on it. And so it turns out that in the grand scheme of universal forces, gravity is ridiculously smaller than the electrostatic force. The electrostatic force is less than the weak nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force is less than the strong nuclear force. So very often when they're dealing on the atomic level, they'll ignore gravity because it's such a small part compared to the other ones. Uh, and very often when they write equations with that, they leave gravity out altogether. Now, gravity does have one thing working for it, and that's that it's all in one direction. So everything is being attracted to everything else with mass, unlike the electrostatic force, which is both attractive and repulsive, and we have overall most things have the same amount of charge. There's a lot of canceling out. 